Good morning. Welcome to Central. If you're visiting with us, you truly are honored guests and hope you come back each and opportunity you may have. If you are visiting with us, there's a white card on the back of the pew in front of you. I um, encourage you to fill one of those out and just leave it in the pew beside you. We won't call you, bother you too much, or do that. We just want to. We just want to know your presence here and just get to know you. I encourage you to stay after services so we can get to know you a little better. If you are also a reminder, we also um, we start at 9 o'clock in the mornings on, for Bible study um, on Sunday mornings and 10 o'clock worship service. 5 o'clock evening services. Also Wednesday, 10, 10 o'clock Bible study and 6.30 evening services. There'll be further announcements at the end of services, and let's get back to our worship service. John 14, verse 21. He, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Job chapter 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. I know.
Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Holy words, long preserved. Bow with me, please. A merciful Father in heaven, have so much to be thankful for. We count our blessings each and every day. We live in such a blessed country, such a peaceful time. We pray for Father that you continue to bless us as you have. We do pray that those things that we do here today, you will accept as our humble worship. We pray, Father, that that, uh, that each soul that comes here today comes closer to Thee for being here each and every day. As we take these things from this place that we hear, we become better and stronger Christians, soldiers in Thy army. We do pray, Father, for for those of our number that are sick and ailing in different ways. We pray for those that are fighting with cancer. We pray that you just strengthen them. You help us to help them by encouraging them, by helping them carry what load that they're having to find difficult at this time. And that goes for each and every one of us as we look across the congregation, we see those of our number that struggle from time to time, and we want to help and encourage each and every one. 
And as we look out across this world, Father, that we know is struggling to, to understand what is right and what is good that we know that you have defined for us and for mankind what is right and what is good. Help us to help them to understand that these things came from you. We pray for our world. We pray for the wickedness that's in it. We can help to eliminate and be in your army. We can go out and fight and show people that there is a better way. That way that they think seems so right is not right, but I have to sign, that's told us what the right way is. Help us in our efforts. Bless our every efforts as we do these things. We do pray, Father, for, for the younger folks that are raising kids now. In these times, we know it's difficult. And we pray that they'll keep coming here to uh, help them to understand what is right and what is good. That the freedom we enjoy in this country is the freedom that our country provides, but that you have defined the parameters of our freedom and we're to operate as New Testament Christians. Help us to understand these things, to glean from thy word what you have told us, these truths that we're supposed to live by, and we hold them close in our hearts. We do pray for, for men like Wayne and Demar and those that are helping them in far lands to spread the gospel. We're thankful for the years of service that they've, they've been out in places that we've never seen. And they've converted Christians that are holding fast to thy word. And we thank you for these good men. We pray, Father, that you will help us to continue to get the means to support them in that effort and going out from this place. We thank you so much for Jesus and showing us what a real sacrifice is, that perfect sacrifice that covers all of our sins, covers our sins that we may stand justified before thee and you can look directly in our face. We pray, Father, when our time here on earth is through, we come home to be with thee, that we will hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Bless this congregation. Bless the church worldwide as it operates as you have designed it. Thank you again for Jesus, for it's in his holy name that we do pray. Amen. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is a name I love.
The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, said in verse number 31 and 32, uh, after he had t talked to him about taking of the Lord's Supper, the night which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, then he took the cup, and he blessed it, broke it. He says this, For if we would judge uh, ourselves, we should not be judged. But when ye are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Oftentimes people ask, why is it that you have to come together in a group? It is because that's the authority that Christ gave. When ye come together to eat. He didn't say when you separate, when you go your own way, when you want to meet with just one or two. But it is the assembly of the church. When ye come together, is it not to eat? And the context there bears out that that is dealing with the Lord's Supper. So I'd like to emphasize and express appreciation how that we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and how we partake of this communion, the bread representing the Lord's body and the cup representing his blood. If you would, let's give thanks. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee so much for this sacrifice that thou hast made for us. We ask thee to be with us and to bless us, that as we search our souls and as we offer our worship to thee, that this aspect of our worship, that we're thinking about the sacrifice of Christ that was made on Calvary's cross. Bless this bread, bless it to each of us, Forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. All wise and eternal Father, we're grateful to thee for the sacrifice where Christ died on the cross, where he shed his blood, and in the shedding of that blood, he not only purchased the church, but he purchased our sins as well. Bless us as we partake. Forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, but at the same time, we'd like to emphasize the importance of the contribution. The only way that the Lord's Church survives is through free will contributions. We don't have bake sales, we don't have cake sales, we don't have yard sales, all of these other things that are perfectly fine in the world, but that's not what God wants us to do. We support the church through our free will giving. That's why the Bible says, search your hearts and know me. And that our giving will not be grudgingly nor of necessity. We understand God loves a cheerful giver. And another principle that's involved is we give as we've been prospered. Let me tell you something, friends. It's no secret. God has blessed us living in America abundantly. And may we reciprocate with our blessings unto him through our gift. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for every blessing of life that thou has bestowed upon us. We are especially blessed, grateful for thy son and the sacrifice that he made. And as thou hast given us the opportunity to lay by in store, to try our hearts and to make sure that we're giving in the proper way, we ask thy richest blessings upon both the gift and the giver that we're doing so with the right motive in mind. In the name of Christ we pray, and amen. John chapter 14, verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. Are you able? I ask you to please stand. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. Him and forgive. Good to see you all. Today is a big day, at least it is in my mind. It was one year ago this weekend, the first weekend of October last year, that we came for our tryout. And, uh, and it has just been a blessed relationship ever since. You know, they sometimes say there's a honeymoon period for a new preacher, and we may still be in it, but I'm not seeing the excitement diminished, that, that feeling that was here a year ago is not waning. And I'm so excited about our future and so encouraged by what God is doing here at Central already. And today was an example of that. We began a, a teenage class this morning, a preteen and teen class. And if you have kids or grandkids who are in that age, uh, Make sure that they're coming. We had six this morning, and I know that we have two or three who will normally be here who, who weren't here today. So 
we've already got a great group. This is going to be our youth group. These are the ones who are going to grow and develop together, and it was exciting. We are, we are going to examine in that class some of the questions that our young people have on their hearts and minds, some questions that are important to them, parents, grandparents of our preteens and our teens. I have asked them between now and next Sunday to come up with a list of 10 questions, at least 10 questions, things that they think about, things that they have heard, things that are on their minds and their hearts, and we're going to look at those questions over the next several months from a biblical perspective. We're going to try to give them a biblical answer. So I want you, parents and grandparents, guardians, to go through those questions with them this week. Make sure they've got a list. doesn't have to be 10, but I think 10 is a good number. It'll get them to be thinking about things. One question will lead to another, but bring some questions to me. There's no question that's off limits. There are topics that I know are going to be difficult. They're going to be sensitive. They're questions that our young people are having to deal with. There are issues that they are faced with and confronted with every day in the world at school. And they need to know the biblical answers to these questions, to these matters, and these topics. So by next week, I, I want you to help them to come up with this list. And then we will address them from what the Bible says about them. Our youth group is about to start growing. I know it. I believe it. And so the question that I want us to begin with this morning is, what do our young people need? What do our teenagers need from us as parents, as grandparents, as leaders, as examples to them? What do our young people need? You know, as far as I know, every generation changes, of course. Our children are dealing with things that we didn't. We dealt with things that our parents and grandparents didn't, but... As far as I can tell, every generation of young people is still impressed by fancy cars. They still love those fancy cars. And so I want to suggest to you this morning that what our young people need is a Tesla. <laughs> Parents, grandparents, go and start pricing them out. I think it's going to end up being cheaper one day to, <laughs> to have an electric car than a gas but. Maybe not right now, but that's not what I mean, of course. I'm going to use this word Tesla. Our young people, my kids, every time they see a Tesla, they, they point it out. They see one. They recognize them already. I'm going to use this word as an acrostic for some things that our young people, our teenagers, need in their lives. And they need these things from us, from their parents, from their grandparents, the people who are trying to bring them up to be strong and faithful Christians. They need, first of all, teaching. They need instruction. They need to know that the Bible is our authority and the Bible has the answers to their questions. And they need that example from us. We need to be living the Christian life, walking the Christian walk. A walk that they can follow and encouraging them to develop that desire. But we have to intentionally present to them the truth from Bible, from the scriptures, from our own lives and our own experiences. We have to intentionally instruct them in the ways that they should go. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Bring up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We want to instill in them these biblical truths as early as possible. They need teaching. They need encouragement. They need positive reinforcement. They need rewards for when they do right, when they do good. They need a pat on the back from time to time. They need events for uh, designed just for them, to teach them, to show them some things, to develop relationships among their peers. But they need that kind of encouragement that the Christian life is rewarding, that it is good, that it is the best way that we can possibly live. Our young people need lifting up. It can be very depressing, and since covid the statistics are showing us that our young people are dealing with mental health issues at a higher rate maybe than we've ever realized. Hebrews 12 verse 12 tells us to lift up 
the hands that hang down, to lift up the feeble knees, and that applies to our young people as well as everyone else. Our young people need encouragement to live and to walk the Christian life as well as we do. They need teaching, they need encouragement, they need support. They need our presence in their lives. They need us to be there for them and have conversations with them about the things that are important to them, things that they're dealing with. And maybe we don't, maybe we've had a long, hard day at work, and the last thing we want to do is talk about what we think of as minor and insignificant in their lives, but they need us to have those conversations, to show that patience and that kindness and that understanding for what they're going through. They need our support. They need, of course, our love. They need us as parents, as fathers and mothers, as grandparents to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, to not provoke them to wrath, Ephesians 6 verse 4, but to be patient, to be forgiving with them, and to discipline them when they need it. That's how we show that love. They need that selfless, understanding, intentional guidance that we had when we were growing up. And they need to see the proper attitude. They need to know that humility and trust in God is what is going to see us through the difficult times in life. They need to see that we have joy in our salvation. And they need to see that our focus, that our affections are set on spiritual things, on things above, not on physical, earthly, material things matters. They need all of these things from us. In this world, it is difficult. The statistics are showing us that when our young people leave high school, they go off to college, they get out of our homes, their faith is in shambles. But it doesn't have to be that way. If we can give them a Tesla now, maybe it will help them to be faithful even when they get out on their own. We need to provide that teaching, encouragement, support love, and attitude. They need to see in us what the most important thing is. They need to see what the main idea is of being a Christian. They need to know the central idea. If I were to start a blog, I don't know if very many people even have blogs anymore. I used to, but that's been a long time ago now. I might call it the central idea. Because that's what we want to focus on and that's what we want to instill in our young people especially. That that there's a central idea, there's a main thing. If we can just hold on to that, if we can trust in the Lord with all our might, everything else will fall into place. It may not work out the way we think it should or the way we want it to, but if we can trust God that all things work together for our good, it will help us. Through every difficulty, it will help us in so many times in our lives. We need to show our young people what the central idea is. And that means they have to have a clear picture of what the central idea is not. What the main idea in Christianity is not. Now I'm going to try to move through these things pretty quickly. And so if you are taking notes and you want a little more detail on some of these things, you can just ask me. I'll give you a printout, a handout. I can email that to you. Uh, But I can give you more details if you can't get all of this for your notes. But they need to have a clear understanding of what is not the main idea, the main uh, thing in Christianity. And it is not, our young people need to understand, it's not t-shirts, it's not banners, it's not slogans, it's not beach trips, it's not sunrise services, it's not these... Uh, Youth retreats where 10,000 kids come and experience an emotional high. It's not the church camp phenomenon, as Doug mentioned on Wednesday night. These things are all well and good. Our kids need to develop these relationships, and they need to have these opportunities to be together, but they need to understand that's not the main thing. That's not what's most important to living faithfully until death. It's not whether the church provides for me these t-shirts and these trips. I've worked with churches before and I I can think of one that I would call a t-shirt church. (laughs) 
They had a t-shirt for everything, for every event. But that's not the main thing. That's not the most important part of being a Christian. It's certainly not the central idea. It's not those things. It's not college degrees. Sometimes we think the main idea, the main part of worship is the sermon. And we're trying to teach our young people and show our our teenagers. It's not that. Every act of worship is equal. We put a lot of emphasis on the sermon and on the preacher. But the main idea, the central idea is not whether he has a Ph.D., It's not the college degrees, the letters that follow our names. It's not what preaching school he attended. It's not how many books he's written. And it's certainly not speaking on lectureships. Those things are all great. They're wonderful. They help. They they encourage us. They develop our faith and give us an opportunity to grow and strengthen. But those things aren't the most important part of living the Christian life. We can live, we can be faithful without any of them. They're not the main thing. They're not the central idea. The central idea is not personal pride. It's not pride the way the world uses the word pride today. The main thing about Christianity is not social justice. It's not being active in our communities. It's not making a name for ourselves and being somebody. It's not developing our own brand or or establishing a personal identity for ourselves. Those things, again, they are important. They can serve a purpose. But those things are not the central idea of being a Christian. And our young people certainly need to understand that the central idea is not what we post and what we see on TikTok or Instagram or Twitter. or any. It's not Twitter anymore, is it? It's X. It's not social media. That's not life. That's not the most important thing to us. It's not the fame or the recognition or the number of followers that we have on those venues. That's not what being a Christian is about. We can have a good influence and we can bring people to Christ in these ways. But this is not the most important thing about life, about being a Christian. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 is where we find that we are to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And in fact there, Paul says, for ye are dead. You're dead as Christians. You're not the person you used to be. Those things that used to be important to you have changed. For ye are dead, verse 3, Colossians chapter 3, and your life, that is your identity, your life is hid with Christ in God. Our identity is not how we portray ourselves on social media. Our young people need to understand that. Verse 4 of Colossians 3 says, when Christ, who is our life. See, that's the central idea. That's the main thing. Living like Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Our young people need to know this is not what life is about. This is not the central idea. It's also not entertainment in our lives, especially in worship. But outside of worship as well, our our lives can't revolve around our entertainment, meaning Video games, sports, movies, music, that cannot be the central thing in our lives. But especially as it pertains to worship, entertainment isn't the central idea of what we do in worship. Just yesterday, Patrick saw it, I'm sure some of you did as well. There was a post on one of the Sarah Land Facebook groups, Voices of Sarah Land, I think it was maybe. Someone just asked, uh, I'm looking for a church. What's a church that, that you would recommend? And I knew it was going to get me in trouble as soon as I posted it, and I wasn't sure I, I should or, or ought to, but I went ahead and just posted this question. I said, are you looking for the truth or are you looking for entertainment? Immediately, the original poster came back and said, well, I guess I know whose church not to visit. Okay. That was kind of what I expected, but that answered my question as well. But I wanted to respond. I didn't. I wanted to respond. The fact that you think it's a person's church says a lot. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not the pastor's church. It's no one's church. It belongs to the Lord. But 
I didn't go that route. I just simply said, think about it. And the longer my post stayed up, my response stayed up, the more positive the reaction became. There were several then who even messaged me privately and said that was a profound question. It's something we all need to think about. We can't just brush that aside. It's a good question. Are you looking for the truth or are you looking for entertainment in worship? The main point, the central idea of our worship to God is not our entertainment. It's not about having laser shows and fancy PowerPoint presentations. Patrick does a great job, but we didn't have those for generations. We, could, we can worship God without having something to look at and follow along on a screen. That's not the most important thing. It's not about praise teams, and it's not about emotionalism. Those are, those are not the central idea. That's not the main point of what we do in worship. We also want to understand, we want them to understand that the, the central idea is not having the biggest building. It's not necessarily even updating our facilities to be new and having up-to-date technology. It's not about having coffee and donuts in the foyer for everyone. It's not even about having padded pews. These are all luxuries. They are all comforts that we enjoy, but that's not what living the Christian life is all about. We're thankful that God has blessed us with these facilities, but we could be Christians even if we didn't have a building to meet in, even if we had to meet out under the trees, even if we had to change our location from week to week, we'd still be the church. We'd still be who we are. Would you be here if we didn't have these facilities, if we didn't have these comforts? Are you dedicated enough to Christ to say these things really don't matter? They're not the main idea. They're not the central thing about being a Christian. There's so many things that we could keep going on about what the central idea is not. I think our lives, to a large degree, boil down to this. We try to be as busy as possible. We try to be as loud as possible. And we try to have as rich an experience as possible. When I say richness here, I'm not talking about necessarily the amount of money that we have, but just how, how full our lives is. When we think of food, someone, sometimes we describe it as being very rich. It's full of flavor. And that's what we dedicate our lives to do, being as busy as possible, as loud as possible, and as rich as possible. But that's not what life is about. That's not the central idea of being a Christian. And we want our young people to understand that. But we can then identify what the central idea is, what the main thing is. And it is, first and foremost, God. Knowing God. Believing in God and knowing Him personally. Knowing who He is, the way He thinks, what He expects of us. God. Knowing His nature. Knowing what He has said to us. God is the main thing. He is the central idea. And when we say God, we mean the divine nature. We mean the Godhead. We mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Knowing God means knowing the distinctions between the three. It means realizing we're never going to understand Him perfectly and fully, but I want to grow every day and be better at my, in my understanding of who He is and what He expects of us. Philippians 3 verse 10 is where Paul says that I might know him. This is why he's living. This is why he's pursuing. This is why he's trying to apprehend that which has already apprehended him. Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Everything in life is about knowing him, knowing God knowing our Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing them and knowing how I should act as His follower. That's the main thing. That's the central idea. And we want our young people especially to put God first, to put God at the center of their lives. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 in verses 1 and 2, Paul, uh, John there describes that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. God loves the whole world. He wants all to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 2, verse 4, 
1 John 2 verse 3 says, And hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And that's what we want our young people to see, to understand. We keep his commandments because we know God. We keep his commandments because knowing God means that we love God. And so we keep God first in our lives. We keep God as the central idea behind everything that we do. We want our young people to understand that the central idea is truth. John 17, verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When we say truth, we're talking about the Bible. Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, explains to us that all Scripture, the Bible, is given to us by the very breath of God, by the inspiration of God. We want our young people to know that. To believe that, that the Bible is true, every word of it is true, it is inerrant, it has been given to us from God. And Ephesians 3 verse 4, it is understandable. Paul says there in Ephesians 3 verse 4, that when you read what I have written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can have the same understanding of the mysteries of God that I do. The Bible's not hard to understand. Sometimes they say that it's been written at the highest I've ever seen, on a sixth grade reading level, all of us can read and understand Scripture. And we want our young people to know that God's truth, His Word, is the main thing in our lives. And by that knowledge, by that trust in God's Word, we develop a discernment. The ability to determine what's right and wrong. Our young people especially are at that age in their lives where where the world is trying to tell them whatever you want to be right, whatever you want to be true can be right and true. It's up to you. It's subjective. But the Bible is true. What God's Word said is right, and we must have the, the ability to discern between the two. But we want them to know that that's what the main thing is in life. In 1 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2, Peter says, As... Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. And that's what we want our young people to, de to develop, a desire for the truth. God has given us the truth, and that is what we put at the middle, at the center of our lives. We also want our young people to understand that church, that worship with the church. When I say church, I don't mean the building. We're not talking about the structure. It's us. The church is the main thing. Jesus, according to God's will, according to God's eternal plan from before the beginning of the time, came and purchased the church with His blood, Acts 20, verse 28. The church is the center. God's word, church is the pillar in the ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And so the church is the center idea. It is the central part of our lives as Christians because it's the body of Jesus Christ. And we worship together as a church, as his body, as people. And we serve one another. And we want our young people to see and know from our example that that's the main part. That's the main idea. Living like Jesus, serving like Jesus. John chapter 13, verse 15, after he had washed his disciples' feet, he said, I've given you an example that you should follow. That's the main thing about Christianity. Following the example of Jesus, serving one another as members of His body, His church, worshiping according to the New Testament pattern, according to the, the truth that is revealed in His Word that's been given to us according to His inspiration. We want our young people to see that the main thing is living humble, dedicated, hardworking, trusting, content lives in Christ. Humility. To be able to say, my will doesn't matter. It's not about what I want in life, what I want to achieve, what I want to attain. I want to glorify God. I want to serve Him. I want to have a greater faith in my life. That's the main thing. And then the dedication. The dedication to His church, to the work that's going on at the church. To be able to say, yes, I'm a member of that church. That's my people. Together, we're working in this community, trying to make the world a better place, trying to bring people to God. And I'm dedicated to the work that's going on in the Lord's church. We want our young people to see that's the main thing. 
The humility to accept the way life is, to be content that all things do work together for our good. Romans 8 verse 28, the trust to let God order our steps. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. And the, the work ethic to be able to say whatever needs to be done, I'm going to humbly be part of it. I want to see it done. Our young people need to see that that's the main thing. That's the most important part of being a Christian is what I can do to help the cause of Christ spread throughout the world. Our young people need to see that the main thing, the central idea is our eternal destiny. Heaven and hell are real. They need to know that. They need to see us living like we know heaven is our eternal destination. Heaven will be where we will be after this life is over. They need to see that everything that we do here is determining whether we spend eternity in either heaven or hell. They need to know that God has prepared heaven and hell, that God in His Word has told us how to get to heaven and how to avoid hell, that God sent His Son because He loves us, and so we're trying to live every day to be more and more like Him. Heaven and hell are the main things. Our young people need to see that. They need to know that we believe that. That's the central idea behind everything that we do. Our young people need to see that the main thing is our salvation. It is the forgiveness of our sins, our redemption, the change, the total transformation that we have undergone in our lives because of what God has done for us. Because we've read and seen in His Word the proof of His love, the sacrifice of His only begotten Son, Jesus' death on the cross, His burial and His resurrection, which gives us hope. We're living every day because we've been forgiven. He is the center of our lives. He is the main thing for us. And our young people need to have that same focus, that same dedication. Our forgiveness is what keeps us going. What God has done for us, the blessings He's provided for us through Jesus Christ, that's the central thing in our lives. Not the physical, not the material, not how many possessions we can acquire, but that salvation that we have through His blood. Our young people need to see, finally and above all, that faith, hope, mercy, grace, and love are the main thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. We cannot be saved without hope. We must know that because Jesus was resurrected, I have hope of being resurrected after death in my life as well, Romans chapter 5. Grace is what, is what God has done for us that we couldn't ask and certainly don't deserve. Mercy is when He doesn't give us the punishment that we rightly have earned because of our sins, Romans 6, verse 23. And love is the greatest of all. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul tells us there what love does and doesn't do. Love doesn't seek its own. It's selfless. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13, Faith, hope, and love abide. And the greatest of these is love. Our young people need to see that the central idea, the main thing about being a Christian is that we love like God loves. We love everyone because we're all created in the image of God. Because we all have a soul that will spend eternity either in heaven or hell. We love one another because Jesus came to this world to die for the sins of everyone. And we love God because... He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the one who has provided a way for us to be redeemed and forgiven and sanctified. Our young people need to see that love is the main thing in our lives. It's a, it's a hard world. It is a difficult time to be a teenager, to be a young person. But we can do it. We can do it together. We can do it because God has revealed His Word, His truth to us. We can do it because heaven is worth everything we have to do and go through here 
in this life. And our young people need to know that. This morning, if you're here and you know that the central idea of your life, the main thing in your life is not God, it's not His truth, it's not His church, that your will, your, your desires, your passions, your sins are the main thing in your life right now, it's time to change course. It's time to repent. It's time to turn around and go the other direction. Lay your burdens down and take up the yoke of Jesus Christ. It is light and it is easy and it is better than anything you can try to do for yourself in this world. If you're ready to make that change based upon your faith in Jesus Christ, His sacrifice for you, the power of His blood, repent of your sins and make confession that Jesus is the Son of God. And be baptized this morning. If you've never done that, don't wait, don't delay. Make that change right now. Let Jesus be the central part of your life. If you have done that, but you know you've gone back into a former way of life. You know there are things that have dethroned God as king in your heart, and now something else is the center of your life. Make a change. Repent of those things. That's all it takes. We'll pray together. If there's anything that you need, any prayers that you need, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come forward now as we stand and sing? take just a second but uh if you can still hear me over your stomach's growling just uh bear with me and uh, i'll make it quick there's a couple of things that didn't make the bulletin here that i would uh need to address first of all that i got this note a little disturbing that sometimes this morning pat and dale klein's grandson had a motorcycle accident and he broke his collarbone they don't know the hospital or many of the details, but they are requesting our prayers. Now, uh, they are asking for our prayers. That is the most we can do, not the least we can do. That's the most we can do. And uh, we will certainly grant that request before I leave from here. Also got a, uh, a note from Darlene, which is here back with us, wearing matching shoes, no less. Uh, God love her. She's been through the ringer here of late, and she sent this note. It says, with many thanks to you for your kindness. This is to the church, and I'm going to read it aloud. Dear Central Family, thank you for all. Thank you all so much for your many prayers. Thank you to all of the ladies preparing the food for me and the meals and the desserts and all the gentlemen that brought these things who helped us 
to deliver all these supplies, and I helped her by taking the trash out. All of these things mean so much to me. While I was, while I was hurt and not feeling well, with my leg broken, my foot, and especially during the time that my sweet husband Stephen had passed. Thank you all so much for everything. Much love in Christ, Darlene. And we're glad she is back with us. God love her. She has, a, has a, an ordeal that he's here lately. I want to remind y'all that tonight, singing and social, that's on, right? Singing and the social. There you go. Here's a little lesson. I know the kids aren't used to hearing on the radio these days harmony in the songs that they hear. The four-part harmony that we sing, the church sings. If you can think of the lessons of the Bible, not everybody can be a, an ear, not everybody can be a mouth, not everybody can be a foot, not everybody can be this, that, or that. But together, we can be these things that God wants. In our worship, singing is one of the things that we're commanded to do. So come, learn how to sing these parts, and you will find an appreciation. If you don't understand the four-part harmony, you will find an appreciation that you've never, I will say, you've never experienced until you find your voice and how it fits in the melodies that the four-part harmony provides. You know, and if you're singing the wrong part, it ain't comfortable in your voice. Dale Siemens is never gonna sing soprano. I'm just saying, there's a place that your voice fits and you will find that if you hear somebody else singing it, and it makes it so easy. And I'm just telling you, this is, is, a, is a part you can be part of the worship service and fit and not be a strain about it. I, wish, I hope that makes sense, but that's how my mind understands it. It says this, it's a place that we fit easily, and it's a, just like all of Christianity. You fit easily in the church. And we don't always fit easily into the world. Hardly ever do we do that. But into the church. So that's, that is a lesson in the four-part harmony. I hope it makes sense. But um, even better than all of that, learning how to sing these parts, we're going to eat afterwards, which is always wonderful. Because we got some good cooks around here. And there will be plenty of food. Just bring your singing voice and bring your appetite. It's a good time. Next Saturday, right after the Alabama game winds up, we're going to be eating gumbo here. So bring your appetite for that, too. Um, that's next Saturday, about five-ish. We're not, we're not putting a time on that because when folks get here, we're going to have a gumbo and jambalaya plenty. So just come, come one and come all and bring your appetite. Did I get everything? I hope you could hear me over your tummies growling. I know, kind of run long on that. But uh, Richard, in your uh, prayer, would you mention the Klein's grandson in uh, your prayer? Thank you all. Hope that was it. That was it, correct? Let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we approach thy heavenly throne. We just thank you for the opportunity we had to come out and study a portion of thy word and sing praises in thy holy name. We thank you for being with Brother David and Patrick as they led our services today. We ask that we'll take the lesson today and apply it to everybody's life, dear Heavenly Father. We'll reach out and help our teenagers where we can. We ask that you be with those that are sick. We ask a special prayer for 
Mr. Klein's grandson, dear Heavenly Father, we lift him up to you and be with all the others that have mentioned as being sick, being with the doctors and nurses. And we ask you to bring him back at the next time. In Christ's name, amen.